Okay, it is 102, so let's get started. Um, first of all, welcome everybody to the uh, Intro to ggplot seminar. Uh, my name is Andy Lin. Uh, I work for the Office of Advanced Research Computing and also the Institute of Digital Research and Education at UCLA. Uh, and we work as a statistical consulting group and we periodically present these seminars to you. Um, hopefully you got the link to the slides in the confirmation email when you registered. Um, let me go ahead and put that address in the chat for you in case you don't have it already. Um, Here's the website address where those slides are located. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing screens. Okay, so this is where you'll find the slides. <clears throat> and again, if you already don't, if you don't already have uh, the ggplot2 package installed in R or R Studio, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and run this code inside R now, um, because we're gonna be doing an interactive seminar where you'll be participating with the coding as we go along, all right? Now on this page, you'll find a link to the slides themselves right here. If you click on it, it is an HTML slides show. So it will appear in your web browser and you can use the left and right arrow keys to advance uh, the slides, for instance. Um, one thing I'm gonna go ahead and recommend that you do now is to hit the K key uh, on your keyboard, hit K. And what this will do is that um, it will allow you to click on the screen without advancing a slide. If you don't hit K, when you mouse click, it will advance the slide and that will make it hard for you to copy and paste any coding from the slides themselves. So if you want to copy and paste from the slides directly, go ahead and hit the K key. Uh, and then you'll see this little message pop up that says disabled mouse click advance. All right, again, that's K. You'll find, um, some more instructions here. Um, then if you wanna look at the slideshow as one gigantic web page, instead of a slideshow, you can hit the A key and that will create one gigantic page for you instead. So you can choose to view the slides however it makes sense to you. I'll be teaching though from the slideshow itself. Um, and yeah, it's always here on this web page for you to have. So you can even download it if you want from the web page, uh, but it's always here. And then the other thing I wanna make sure you know is that the, all of the code that we're gonna be using for the seminar is located on this page. Now, if you want to interact and try the coding yourself, uh, you don't need to copy this code page. But if you, if you don't think you're gonna type along with us and you want it, you can you know, highlight everything and then just copy it into our, our studio. For instance, I could go like this, copy it all and then just paste it into our studio like this, if you want, and then you can just run the code from here. But I'm going to be typing the code, um, and you can too if you like. All right. Okay. So let me get back to the slideshow. Okay. All right. So let's get started. So this is the introduction to ggplot2 seminar. <clears throat> so the purpose of this seminar is to introduce, of course, how to use the ggplot2 package, which is really great for producing statistical graphics for data analysis. And today we're gonna to describe the underlying system or the grammar of graphics. And we're gonna use a lot of examples. We're gonna practice using the elements of the grammar by creating a customized graph. And then we're gonna address common issues that arise when creating statistical graphics. So the first big chunk of this seminar is gonna be teaching you the grammar itself then we're going to do a lot of practice exercises uh, and then talk about just some advice that I have for you having worked with ggplot for a few years now. Okay. Now, when you look at this uh, slideshow, if you see text that looks like this, it has this uh, sort of gray background and it has a particular font, that will usually mean that it's some sort of R code. And then if you see text with the green background, then that is an instruction for you to try on your own to practice ggplot2 coding. All right, and so we'll be practicing the things in green throughout the seminar today. Okay, so if you don't already have R or R Studio open, go ahead and open it and have hopefully ggplot2 installed. All right. Okay, so we're only going to be using two packages today, um, ggplot2 
and the mass package. And the mass package is um, loaded with R or it's installed with R itself. So you don't need to install it separately. Um, so go ahead and run these two library statements. I'm just gonna go ahead and put them here. All right. Oh, you know what? And I forgot to do a poll. I'm sorry. Let me do one poll really fast. Like that. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just want to get a sense of how much you've all used R and ggplot in the past. So please answer these two questions now. Okay, that is about 95% of you. So I'm just going to end it. All right, so it looks like most of you have used it either a few times or quite frequently, that is R, but most of you have only used ggplot to either a few times or never in the past. All right, that's great. So I don't have to explain a lot of R coding to you. So most of you probably are familiar with the library function. Now, um, oh, I should have gone over other things in the beginning too. Uh, I have two moderators here with me today, uh, Johnny Lin and Siavash Jalal, and uh, they are consultants in my group. You can put any questions that you have in chat and they'll try to answer it. I'm also sort of monitoring chat a little bit myself, but it's not easy for me to look at both things at once. So I may not be able to answer your question if you ask it in chat. Um, if you want, you can also try unmuting yourselves and asking a question directly. It's worked out okay for us in the past, so I, um, I encourage you to, to also look at that, um, to unmute yourself if you'd like also, all right? Okay, I think that's most of the business. I'm sorry, now let's get back to the slides. Okay, okay. Um, so we're gonna run these two library commands in R first. I'm gonna put it in R. Can you share your okay. screen, Andy? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Johnny. Okay, so let's uh, run these in R, just run the library, ggplot2 and the mass library also, okay? Okay, uh, now if you haven't already installed and you're having problems installing, we may not be able to help you. That can take a long time. So hopefully you're not having any trouble. Okay, so what is the ggplot2 package? Well, again, it produces layered statistical graphics it uses an underlying grammar to build the graphics layer by layer rather than providing pre-made graphs. And hopefully this will be more clear what this means as we go along. Uh, fortunately, ggplot2 is easy enough to use without any exposure to the underlying grammar. So you really could use it without knowing the grammar, but it's even easier to use once you do know the grammar, all right? And it allows the user to build a graph from concepts rather than recall of commands and options. So in a, most other statistical software packages, the graphics are built by commands with a bunch of options, and you just have to go looking for all the options for each separate command to understand how to put things together. And ggplot2 has a different way of, of uh, doing things for graphics, and you'll, I think you'll, in the end, like it more, as I do. Um, this seminar is based on I'm sorry, this, uh, a lot of the information that this seminar is based on can be found on this page, which is the reference page for ggplot2. Um, a lot of the links in the slideshow are working or it should take you directly to a page. And this is the page where you'll find all the functions for ggplot. And then if you click on the functions, you'll get a help page for one of them, for instance, this one, okay? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so what is a grammar of graphics? So when we talk about language, a grammar of a language defines the rules of structuring words and phrases into meaningful expressions. Now, when we talk about a grammar of graphics, that grammar defines the rules of structuring mathematic and aesthetic elements into a meaningful graph. And Leland, Leland Wilkinson designed the grammar in 2005, which ggplot2 is based upon. Um, for those of you that use, yes, ggplot2 does load if you just, if you also 
install tidyverse and then library tidyverse ggplot2 will also be installed that way also yes okay um so what are the elements of the grammar of graphics the first element is the data itself so these are the variables that we're going to be mapping to aesthetics features of the graph then there are geoms. Those are the actual objects or shapes that appear on the graph. There are stats, which are statistical transformations that summarize the data, such as graphing the mean or confidence intervals. There are scales, which map aesthetics values to data values, like a color scale, which matches, um, which maps a data value like a one to a color like blue. There are coordinate systems, which are the plane on which the data are mapped. Uh, and then there's faceting, which means splitting the data into subsets to create multiple variations of the same graph. And some of you, some of you may know this as paneling. So the first data set we're going to practice on is called the Sitka data set. It's a data set about trees. Um, uh, the data set comes from the mass package. So hopefully you, you already did library mass. So data sets that are loaded into R with a package are immediately available for use. And again, Sitka is in the mass package. So to see the object appear in RStudio's environment pane so that you can click to view it, you run data on the data set, the data function, and then another function like str on the data set. So we're going to do this right now. We're going to use the data function and the str function on Sitka so that we can actually look at it in RStudio. Okay. So you can type, and again, all of this code is in the code page. So if you don't want to type, you can just follow along and run the code directly from the code page. But I am going to be mostly typing, okay, to give you all time to do this. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Let me do one thing. So once you do this, you'll see that the Sitka data set now appears in the R environment, all right? And I know it's a little weird to have to do two steps to get it to appear, but that's, that's the way it works. So then you'll see that you can click on the data set and look at it. It's not a particularly large data set, but it's good for us to practice on in the beginning. Okay, so the Sitka data set describes the growth of trees over time. And some of these trees are grown in an ozone enriched chambers. Others are not. Uh, the data frame contains 395 rows of the following four columns. Uh, we have size, which is the height of the tree. We have time. Uh, we have the tree ID, which is tree. And we have treat, which is a factor which is coded either control or ozone. Okay. And the slides in this slideshow, by the way, can uh, take more than a full page. So you can scroll down on them like I am now. So here are the first few rows of Sitka, all right? So as you can see, we have like a decimal numeric variable, an integer variable, a one, two classification, I'm sorry, a one, a, an integer ID, and then an ozone or control classification variable. Okay. So <clears throat> we're first gonna talk about the ggplot function itself. All graphics begin with specifying the ggplot function. And note that the function is called ggplot, not ggplot2, which is the name of the package. Inside of the ggplot function, we're going to specify the data set that holds all the variables that we want to put on the graph. Um, and then these variables are mapped to aesthetics, which are the visual properties of the graph. Right? The data set must be a data frame object. So don't try to do this with a matrix uh, of data. Make sure it's a data frame. OK, so the syntax for ggplot goes as following. The first thing that goes inside ggplot is the data set name. All right, so you'll put the data set name here. And then usually inside ggplot, you have another function called AES. And inside of AES, you'll specify variables mapped to various aesthetics. So here, the aesthetics are x and y. And we're saying, put this variable, basically, this x bar variable on the x axis, and put this y bar variable on the y axis. All right? x bar is the name of some variable, y, is the, y bar is the name of some other variable. Okay. <clears throat> Notice that the aesthetics are specified inside of AES, all right? which itself is nested inside of the ggplot function. Okay. 
when you specify aesthetics inside AES, inside of ggplot like this, further functions like geoms will inherit these aesthetics. All right, so this volume and sales maps to X and Y respectively will be inherited by this geom point that we also specify, okay? So here we're saying that Texas housing is the data set. We wanna put volume on the X axis, a variable called volume and a variable called sales on the Y axis. And then we're gonna use geom point, which is basically asking for a scatter plot. And geom point knows that we're gonna put volume on X and sales on Y because it inherits the aesthetics from the ggplot function. Okay, so we're going to start a graph just by specifying the ggplot function. And what we're going to do is we're going to map time to x and size to y from the Sitka data set. Okay, now nothing is actually going to be plotted really just yet, but you'll see it'll start a graph. So it starts with ggplot. Okay, the first thing that comes is the name of the data set, which is called Sitka with a capital S. And again, you can always use the code file if you don't want to type. Then I'm going to specify the aesthetics function, which is another function, another set of parentheses inside. And then I'm going to say x equals time and y equals size. And notice that time is capitalized also in the data set. Okay. If you run that, you'll see that it initiates a graph with x uh, time on x and size on Y, but there's nothing plotted yet. So you'll know, you'll probably guess by now that we need the geom in order to plot some shapes on the graph, but we'll get there in just a moment, okay? Any questions so far about what we've done? We wanna make sure that we're caught up at this point because this is the basis for everything that we're gonna do from now on. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. If you have questions while I'm talking, go ahead and put them in chat and somebody um, will, answer it. Make sure you have the mass library loaded if you can't load in Sitka, all right? Okay, so as I said, just specifying X and Y alone will produce an empty graph like this. Now we add layers to the graph using the plus. And these layers can consist of geons, stats, scales, and themes, all of which we're gonna discuss in detail as the seminar progresses. Okay, remember that each subsequent layer inherits its aesthetics from ggplot. However, you can also specify AES within a specific geom to override the aesthetics that are specified in ggplot, okay? So here I have an example. We have the same uh, Texas housing as before. Uh, I have volume on X and sales on Y. And I added the geom point, the scatter plot as before, which will put, again, points defined by volume and sales. But then um, those are black, by the way, they're not colored. But then I add a rug plot, which are these little hash marks that go along the X and Y axis. And you'll notice I added a new aesthetic called color. So that will only color the rug plot. Notice that it does not color the scatter plot formed by geom point. So geom po all, both geom point and geom rug inherit x equals volume, y equals sales. But then geom rug adds on top of that color equals median. So it gets colored while geom point does not get colored, okay? So you can override aesthetics or add new aesthetics inside the, the actual geom or stat that you're working with to only apply to that particular geom or stat. Okay, so let's add a geom point layer to the Sitka graph that we just initiated. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just copy this and start a new one. You can, you can, you don't, you can do whatever. You can, you can work off the same one if you like. I'm just gonna keep these separate for now. All right, so I'm adding a geom underscore point which is what you use to initiate a scatter plot, right? Now you'll notice that time is measured kind of discreetly here, so it's not gonna look like a cloud. It's gonna look like discrete time points like this, but still it's a scatter plot. Okay, now I want you to add an additional geom smooth layer to the graph, all right? So how do we add more layers? We add it with the plus. Now, if you're using the plus, 
make sure, and you're using, you're putting your code on multiple lines, the plus should go at the end of the line, not at the beginning of the next line. So like this, I can then add Gion smooth. Okay, what I, uh, what I don't want you to do is to put the plus at the beginning of the next line like this. This R will not recognize that as one continuous command. So put the plus at the end like this. Okay, and then when I do that, it'll add a low S smooth curve, right? So this is sort of like a best fit curve through uh, the data points, okay? Now, both the geon layers, so both the geon point and geon smooth have inherited the X and Y aesthetics from ggplot, okay? Now we're gonna add coloring just to geon point. So inside of geon point, I want you to specify AES and then color equals treat. Okay, so inside of geon point, we're gonna try AES and then color equals treat like that, okay? And again, this should only apply to geon point and not geon smooth, right? So the points will get colored by the treatment variable, right? We have two treatment levels. And so they're orange and greenish, but the geon smooth does not get colored, okay? Because we don't specify the AES inside of geon smooth. Okay. Hopefully that all made sense. Okay, so what are our aesthetics in more detail? Aesthetics are the visual properties of the objects on the graph. Now, which aesthetics are required and which ones are allowed vary by geon to geon. The very commonly used aesthetics are X, which is positioning along the X axis, Y, which is positioning along the Y axis, color, which is the color of objects. For 2D objects like squares, it's usually the color of the object's outline. Um, for 2D objects, fill will often be fill will often be well. Sorry, fill will often be used to specify the color that fills the object. Line type is used for different kinds of line patterning, like solid solid lines or dashed lines. Uh, shape is to change the shape of markers and scatter plots. Size is how large objects appear, and alpha is the transparency of objects, where zero is transparent and one is opaque. So it's some number between zero and one. Um, basically, it's the inverse of how many stack, stacked objects it will take to be opaque. So if it takes two objects to be opaque, you want to specify 0.5 for alpha or one over two. If you want it to be really transparent such that 100 objects would have to be stacked in order for it to be opaque, you would specify one over 100 or 0 0.01. Okay, well, let's change the, the aesthetic color to shape in our graph. Okay, so I'm gonna change color to shape here. All right. And let's see what happens to our graph when we run that. All right, now you'll notice that treatment has two different shapes, a circle for control and a triangle for ozone. All right, so it's really nice how easy it is to change which aesthetic your variable is mapped to just by changing one little word, right? Really easy. Okay, so what we've been doing is mapping. And by mapping, I mean that we are taking a variable and mapping it to an aesthetic such that whenever the variable varies, the aesthetic will vary, right? So for instance, here, I have color mapped to median. And median is just stands for the median value of the house in that market. So the median value is not a single number. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a variable called median, all right? And when median varies, the color varies, right? So when median is 50,000, it's this dark blue. When median is 300,000, it is this light blue, all right? So mapping means that when the variable changes, the aesthetic changes, all right? And you do all of, you map inside of the AES function. All right, the key is mapping happens inside of AES. Now, sometimes we don't want, we want to set an aesthetic, but we don't want it to vary, or we don't want to vary with a variable. In those cases, you're going to set the aesthetic and you do that outside of the AES function, okay? So notice again, up here, we said color equals median inside of AES. Down below, we're going to be setting the color to green 
outside of AES, all right? Therefore, nothing is varying with the color, so the color is constant. No AES. So I want you to try this. Create a new graph for data set Sitka, a scatter plot of time versus size where all the points are colored green. Okay. So I'm going to start a new one. It's going to be based very similar to what we did before. Right. It's going to start with the scatter plot of time versus size. But now, did I say green? Yes. We're going to color all of the data points green. Now, since we want to set it to a constant, we're not going to use AES. Okay. Easy. So just remember, if you want to set something to a constant aesthetic value, do it outside of AES. Now, if you try to set it to a constant inside of AES, you can get strange results like this. So notice I'm trying to set it to a constant inside of AES, and it's not green. It's this strange orange color. So if you see this happening and you're trying to set it to a constant, look and see if you try to specify it inside of AES. Okay? Okay. As far as colors, James, we're going to go over that later on in the seminar. But yes, it, it, re it recognizes different ways of specifying colors. We'll get to that. OK, any questions so far? OK, well, if you have any more questions, go, ask, go ahead and ask him in chat. Um, now we're going to be talking about the geoms. And again, these are the shapes that we are plotting on the graphs themselves. So here I have an example of several of geoms. Um, some of the ones that are commonly used are geom bar for bar graphs, box plot, error bar. Uh, for if you need to add error bars to bar plots, for instance, you would use geom error bar or bar. If you need error bars for even a scatter plot, you can do it for geom error bar. Uh, if you need like a kernel density, geom density, histograms line plots, and then geom point for scatter plots. For confidence bands, you'll use geom ribbon. If you need a, like a low S smooth or even a least squares fit smooth, you can use geom smooth. And if you need to add text, uh, you can use geom text. Now geom text is more for though, if you want to add text at various data points. So for instance, if I wanted to replace these dots with letters, I could use geom text. If you want to add a little annotation to the graph, you know, just to label a single data point, that's going to use the annotate function, which we'll discuss later on. Okay, so we're going to start going over some geoms. Each geom is defined by aesthetics required for it to be rendered. So every geom has its own set of aesthetics that you have to specify to use it. For example, geom point requires both X and Y. Uh, the minimal spe specification for a scatter plot, right? For any scatter plot, you're going to have to have at least one variable on X and one variable on Y. Um, geoms differ in which aesthetics they accept as arguments. For example, geom point accepts the aesthetic shape. Remember, shape uh, determines what shape the scatter plot points take. Um, while geom bar, though, does not accept the shape aesthetic, right? The, Geom bars for bar graphs, and there's no real use for shape in bar graphs. Check the geom function help files for required and understood aesthetics. In the aesthetics section of the geom help file, required, required aesthetics will be bolded. All right, so let me show you what I mean. If I go to R and I do a help file for, let's say, geom point, right, you do question mark and then the name of the function. When you go to the help file, Um, after arguments, and, uh, you'll find this aesthetic section, and you'll see that X and Y here are bolded. So the bolded ones are the required arguments. So you have to specify X and Y to use geom point. The other arguments, though, are optional. So all of these, though, are acceptable to geom point. It understands them, but X and Y are required. Okay. 
All right, so we're gonna take a look at some geoms. We'll start with geom histogram. Uh, histograms are great for examining the distribution of continuous variables by basically binning or binning the continuous variable into so many bins and then counting how many observations fall into each bin. Okay. Uh, Geon histogram cuts the continuous variable mapped to X. So you're going to use X aesthetic with Geon histogram and then counts the number of values within each bin. Okay. So let's create a histogram of size, the variable size from data set Sitka. So started, I'll just start typing again. So I'm going to do ggplot, Sitka, okay, AES. Now the only thing we need for histogram is X. And I think I said size was what we're going to look at the distribution of, okay? And then I'm going to add geom histogram. Okay, I should, you know, I'm not going to use tab completion. I'm going to go slower, geom histogram, okay? And then if you run that, you should get a nice histogram. Now you'll also notice that R has given us this little message. And it says stat bin using bins equals 30. Pick a better value with bin width 30. I'm sorry, with bin width. And basically what it's saying is that it has picked 30 bins for you. And it's just arbitrarily picked this number. It's saying choose a better number that works better for your data. Okay. So we can change this using the bins argument. Let's say now bins equals 30 may be too fine. Let's go to something coarser with bins equals 20. Okay. Now notice that bins is not an aesthetic. All right. It's not going to vary with a variable. We're setting it as a constant. So we're going to do this outside of AES. So just go into geom histogram and then type bins equals 20. And that will change the look of the histogram. Because now it's going to use just 20 bins instead of 30. So it looks a little smoother like this, okay? Easy, right? Really easy stuff. Okay, so that's histogram. Density plots are basically uh, smoothed histograms, right? Um, but unlike histograms, density plots can be plotted separately by group by mapping a grouping variable to color. So you can't do this, you can't do color equals something for, um, histograms. It will not overlay histograms like this. Instead, you should use a density plot. Okay, we're not going to be practicing on every single thing in the seminar, so don't be, uh, don't be surprised if we're not going to practice everything. Box plots are great for visualizing uh, distributions also, but they're also great for visualizing distributions across groups, right, or comparing distributions. Um, so, for instance, the middle line might be the median, and the first and uh, the top and the bottom of the box are like the first and third quartiles. I'm not going to go into what all of these um, little, what all the graphics mean. You can look over that yourself. But I want you to show you that it's very easy to make this grouped box plot in R. All you have to do is map the grouping variable to X, and then the the variable whose distribution you want to Y. Okay, so here we're, we're going to try this. We're going to use geom box plot to compare the distribution of size across levels of treat. Okay, so which one do we want to map to which? Well, we're comparing the two treat groups. So treat will go on X, and we want the distribution of size, so size will go to Y. Okay, okay. so it's going to be ggplot. Sitka, um, and then AES, X equals treat, right? We're putting treat on the X axis, we're putting size on the Y axis, and then I'm gonna do geom box plot like that, all right? On that, I'll get two box plots so I now can easily compare the distributions of these two groups, okay? Okay, that's box plot. Bar plots. Uh, lots of you are gonna probably wanna make these bar plots and they're really useful, I would say, for plotting counts or frequencies, right? Um, so by default, that's what it will try to do. So if I specify a variable to X and then use geom bar, 
it will take the values of x, count how many observations fall into each category defined by x, and then plot those counts. Okay. Um, so by default, the height of the bar will represent the count of each value. All right. So we're going to start a new graph where we're going to uh, graph the frequencies of treat from Sitka. Okay. Now remember that we're mapping the variable to x. Count is what's going on y, not the variable itself. So the variable whose frequencies you want to count put on x for g on bar. Okay, so I'm going to do ggplot again. Sitka aes x equals treat. Okay, again, the variable whose categories you want to count put on X, and then we're going to do a geom bar. Right. So on that, and now we have a easy way to visualize the relative counts of these two levels of the variable. Okay. Now the colors that fill the bars is not controlled by the aesthetic color, but instead by fill, F-I-L-L. Which can only be mapped to a factor variable. Okay, we can visualize a cross tabulation of variables by mapping one of them to fill in geom bar, right? So this is basically a visualization of the cross tab, cross tabulation of the variables cut and clarity. Okay, so here I've just mapped clarity to fill, and it has eight levels, I think. And yeah, now you can see each of the eight levels represented for each cut. Okay. We're gonna try this ourselves. Uh, add the aesthetic mapping fill equals factor time. Time itself is not declared a factor in the Sitka data set. So we're gonna force it to be a factor by putting it inside of the factor function. All right. So I'm just gonna add to the previous one that we did. I'm gonna say now fill equals factor, and then inside another set of parentheses, time, capital I. Okay. And now when I run that, I should get a uh, stacked bar chart, which is a visualization, basically, of this table. Right. This cross-tabulation table is visualized by this graph. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, when I say that I'm, I'm asking for you to unmute yourselves, if you don't wanna unmute yourself, just put it in the chat. Okay, scatter plots we've already visited a little bit um, with geom point, right, geom point. I've <laughs> so many times written geom scatter, but just remember it's geom point. Um, and again, we need to specify X and Y aesthetics for Geon Point, which uh, will then plot the covariation between two variables. Scatter plots are, you know, one of the very basic plots that are very, very versatile and used for many different things. Okay. So they're very flexible also in ggplot because they accept a lot of different aesthetics, right? So for instance, you can put lots of variables onto one graph. So we're going to map variables to aesthetics color, shape, size, and alpha, for instance. Um, maybe not shape here, but we're going to do the others. So here, for instance, I have volume on X and sales on Y again. The color of the points is determined by a variable called median. The size of the points is determined by a variable called inventory. And then the transparency of the points is determined by a variable called listings. All right. And so it's a really nice way of depicting five variables all at once. You can look at the covariation of five variables on one graph. It's pretty cool. Okay. Line graphs um, are somewhat similar to scatter plots in that they require the X and Y, but then they draw some line through them. Usually, you'll need some kind of grouping aesthetic as well to tell ggplot which 
set of data points constitute a single line, right? So here, this data set, Texas housing, has different cities like Houston and Dallas and Austin and so on, different cities in Texas. And so each city has its own set of date by sales data. And so we wanna map, we wanna draw a separate line for each city here. If you don't specify a group, Geom line will interpret that to mean that there's that the entire data set should be represented by one single line. Okay, so this is all I'm saying about here. Now there's different ways to specify separate lines. If you use the group aesthetic, the lines will all be black, for instance. But if you want the different lines to be different colors, you can instead of instead of saying group equals city here, I could say group equals city, uh, color equals city, right? And then that will plot each city line in a different color. And you can also plot them with different line types also as well. Okay. So first, if I don't use any grouping at all, this is what I get. Okay, so this is what if you if the line graph looks really bizarre, not at all like you expected, it's probably because you didn't specify a grouping option. Okay, so again, GM line is trying to interpret this as one single line and just doesn't make any sense. Okay, now instead, I'm going to use color. Okay, and you can see now there's a lot of colors in this data set. I'm sorry, there's a lot of cities in this data set. So it has to go through a lot of colors, but it tried. Each city now is represented by a different color. So instead of saying group equals city, I said color equals city instead. Okay, so we're gonna try this. We're gonna create a line graph for Sitka with time on X and size on Y. We've done that many times, but now we're gonna also add group equals tree uh, and then use a geom line. Okay, so let's start with that. So I'll type this. So ggplot sitka aes x equals time, y equals size. And now I have group equals tree. Okay, that's new. The group equals is new. And now I'm going to add geom underscore line like that. Okay. So everything we've done before, but now we're adding group equals tree and changing it to geon line. And so from this, we should expect all black lines, right? Because we're saying just group them by tree, don't do anything else. Okay. Now we can specify instead of group equals tree, we can do color equals tree or line type equals tree. And that will also draw separate lines. Um, Sometimes, now I have to admit, sometimes I don't quite understand. Sometimes you need group equals tree in addition to color equals tree, and sometimes you don't. But it never hurts to have group equals there, so I would often just leave it. And now I'm going to add color equals tree, and you can see that now it's coloring the trees, uh, coloring the lines by tree. But I could also do line type equals tree. Now there's only a few line types, so it has to recycle them a lot. Oh. It will not, in fact, allow me. I'm sorry. So because lot tree is a continuous variable, it really wants a discrete variable because there's only a few line types. So it doesn't like that. So line types are only really appropriate if you only have, like, let's say, fewer than 10 maybe different groups. OK. Um, we're going to. Any slide mark with an asterisk um, is an optional slide. Um, actually, I really like stats. OK, stats are great. I'm going to go ahead and go over it. Um, the stat functions, they transform data, usually as some form of summary, like the mean or standard deviation or even a confidence interval. Right. So you don't necessarily have to calculate them. If you want to plot the means of a variable, you don't necessarily have to calculate them beforehand. Okay. Each stat function is associated with a default geom, so no geom is required for shapes to be rendered. One of the really useful ones I like is called stat summary. Basically, what it will do is it'll apply a summary function like mean to the variable map to y for each value of the x variable. All right, so it'll apply some function to the data map to y for each group specified to X, basically. 
The default summary function is called mean SE, which will return the mean and the standard error. And then it'll plot it using something called geom point range, which basically plots the central point and then these standard error bars. Okay. And so what I've done here is I've, we've seen this exact ggplot specification many times. So I have x equals year, y equals sales. But stat summary is going to say, OK, I'm going to run mean standard deviation on year for each value of sales, right? So sales, I'm sorry, the other way around. <laughs> it's going to run mean standard deviation on standard error on sales for each year, for each year. Right, so for 2000, we get the mean and stand, standard error for sales for 2001 and 2002. So for instance, uh, you, this could be a different function besides mean and standard error. It could be the log or it could be the variance. Whatever function you want to plot across different groups, you can use stat summary for, all right? It's really, really useful. I'm not going to bother doing the example. Um, I don't want where, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but it's really great not having to create a summary data set of means and standard errors first, okay? And if you want to plot the means directly, look into stat summary. Scales, so we've discussed geoms. Those are all the shapes. Now we're gonna discuss scales. And scales define which aesthetic values are mapped to which data values, okay? So here's an example of a color scale that defines which colors are mapped to the values treat. Okay, so there's only two values of treat, ozone and control. And for instance, we could map red, ozone to red and control to blue. Okay, but you know, we might not like the colors that ggplot chooses for us. We might instead want to use, let's say, green and orange. Well, in order to change things like color scales, we use the scale function. The scale functions um, allow the user to control the scales for each aesthetic. These scale functions have names with, uh, which are something like this. It'll have the word scale, then the name of some aesthetic, and then some suffix, all right? So aesthetic is something like color or shape or X, and then some, the suffix is some descriptive word that defines the functionality of the scale. I know that's a little vague. Let me give you some examples. So for example, we have here scale, right? O scale, color. So this is gonna affect the color aesthetic. Manual, which tells you, oh, I'm gonna manually specify which colors are on the color scale. Or I could use scale color hue. And scale color hue is if you want to define an evenly spaced color scale by specifying a range of hues and then the number of colors on the scale. Okay, or there's a scale shape manual, right? So I'm changing the aesthetic now. And here I'm saying I want to now define which shapes are being plotted. And I'm going to have to do this manually, right? I'm going to specify them myself. Okay. Okay. So Let's give you an example. Um, first, let me show you that uh, there's a link here to the documentation page on scale. There are a lot of scales um, to look through. So you have quite a bit of control, but with that control, you're gonna have a lot of different functions to look through. Okay, so here is a color scale that ggplot2 chooses for us. So here I did not, I just said color equals cut, and then ggplot chooses these five colors for cut to use. Let's say I, I, for some reason, don't want to use those colors and I want to specify my own colors. We can use, for instance, use scale color manual to specify which colors we want to use, right? So here, remember, as we add each layer and a scale is a layer, we add a plus and I'm using here scale color manual, right? Manual means I'm going to specify myself which colors it's going to use. And so I then specify a vector, there's a, argument called values. And then after values, I specify a vector of colors. Each there here, I just name them with their names. And here it use red, yellow, green, blue, and violet, right? So whichever is one, one, two, three, four, five, or however this cut variable is ordered, the first one will be red, second one will be yellow and so on. Okay. Okay. 
let's try this. So we're going to create a new graph um, where we have a scatter plot of time on X and size on Y. We're going to color the points with tree first. All right, so let's just get to that point first. So DD plot, Sitka, AES, X equals time, Y equals size, okay, plus, oops, and then color equals treat, excuse me, color equals treat, okay. And then I'm going to add G on points, and we'll get the default colors that GGM plot takes for us. Now, I want to change those two colors to orange and purple. And so I'm going to use scale color manual to do that. Okay. So after G on point, I'm going to add a new layer, scale, oops, underscore color, underscore manual. And inside the parentheses, values defines the values on the color scale, right? So I said, I think orange and purple. This. So C, remember the C function defines a vector, and then inside the parentheses, you just list the elements of that vector. And now I have orange and purple data points. Okay. Make sense? Scale color manual, any questions on this one so far? Question? Nope. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at other scale functions. Now remember, it may be a little mysterious to you, but the X and Y are aesthetics. And these two axes, I'm sorry, was there a question? I had a question. Yes. I didn't know which variable you were setting the colors to. So originally I set them to this variable tree. And without this scale color manual, it will use its own colors. It picked this kind of orangish and greenish color well, I don't know, red and green, let's say, red for control and then blue for ozone. But let's say I don't like those colors and I want to change them to orange and purple. Then I add this scale color manual and then it will change this, this to orange, this reddish color, and change this greenish color to purple. But those are the, those are defined by this variable called treat, right? In this data set, there's a variable called treat. Does that answer your question? It does. Yes, okay. thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, yes. So the X and Y axes um, are aesthetics as well. So we're going to use scale functions to control the scaling of these axes. Okay. When Y is mapped to a continuous variable, we will typically use scale Y continuous to control its scaling. Otherwise, you're going to use scale y discrete if y is mapped to like a factor variable or a discrete variable. Similar functions exist for the x aesthetic. Okay, so a description of some of the important arguments to scale y continuous. Uh, one is breaks. Breaks tells uh, ggplot at what data values along the range of the x axis to place tick marks and labels. So tick marks are these little have these little dashes right here, and then the labels. So um, breaks tells ggplot where to put these marks and labels. Then the labels say, what do I want to put on these labels themselves? What should the labels say? And then name is the name of the axis. So you control the tick marks, the labels, and the name of the axis with the scale function. Okay, so currently, on the y-axis, we have price, and it's measure, it has tick marks for 0, 5,000, 10,000, and 15,000, okay? That's what it does by default without me inter intervening. Now instead, let's say I wanna put more tick marks in there, okay? So I'm adding additional tick marks by using this breaks function, all right? And I say, I want tick marks with labels at 0, 2,500, every 2,500 all increments of 2,500, right? Now you can see there are additional ticks and labels. Now I'm gonna relabel the tick marks to reflect the units of thousands. Let's say I don't like all these zeros. 
and I want to now change them into thousands units. So the breaks are still, you know, the breaks is at what data value do I want to put a tick mark? The labels though are how they're actually labeled on the graph, right? So I'm labeling the, the zero value with a zero. I'm labeling the 2,500 value though with a 2.5. I'm labeling the 5,000 with a five. I'm basically cutting off three zeros, right? So now I've relabeled the tick marks with the labels function. And then the final step is relabeling the access title to reflect that's now price in thousands, right? So I have price thousands of dollars with the name, all right? So breaks tells it what ticks and what, where do I want ticks and labels? Labels are what is actually printed on the labels and then the name of the axis is name. Okay. We're gonna do this for the X axis, okay? So right now, I think um, these are labeled in days. So right now time is measured in days. So if I look at, sorry, one of my graphs, time here is measured in days, okay? Let's say instead I want to change it to months. So 150, we're just going to say there's 30 days in a month to be um, to make it easy. And we're going to say 150 is five months, and then six months, seven months, and eight months. So we want to change those four tick marks to five, six, seven, eight, and then relabel the x-axis time and month. Okay, let's try this. So I'm going to start with the same scatter plot that we've done a million times. I'm typing this out. You again may just want to copy and paste up to here basically, but I'll type this out to give you time to do that. X equals time, Y equals size, okay, plus geom point. Okay, so this is where we're going to start. We want to relabel these to be five, six, seven, eight, and to rename the access. Okay. So I'm going to use scale. Now I'm using the x axis. So I make sure to do scale x continuous, not scale y, like the example was doing. Okay. So the first step is where do I want the tick marks? And that goes in breaks. Okay. So I'm, I'm using the same tick marks. So I'm just going to specify them again 150, 180, 210, and 240. Okay. But now I want the labels to look different. I want the labels to represent months. So I'm going to label them five, six, seven, eight. Like that. Okay. And then I'm going to rename the axis to be time and months. And after you type all that, if you run it, it should fix everything. Yep, now we have five, six, seven, eight along the X axis. And I have time and months here too. Now, if I wanted to, I could add even more, you know, I could add, you know, for instance, 165 here, and I could have a 5.5 if I wanted to. I hope this works. Yeah, so you can customize this however you want, you know, and add or subtract whatever makes sense to you. But it gives you a lot of control over your graph when you know how to do things like this, okay? And so whenever you need to change the way an aesthetic is scaled, you're gonna use the scale function. Any questions on what we just did? I know that was a little more complicated than what we've done before. Okay. Um, a lot of times you're going to want to modify the axis limits or the, just the titles. Um, if you just want to modify simple things like the limits and titles, uh, ggplot provides some convenience functions for you. Uh, these are called limbs for the limits or x limb and y limb. The limbs function can set the limits for both the x axis and the y axis. Uh, but if you want to just specify one limit, uh, the, the, the limits for one axis, you can use x and y limb. And then if you want to retitle the axes, you can use xlab ylab for the x and y axis, ggtitle for the title of the whole graph, and then labs can handle all three of those. So generally I just use limbs and labs, but if you need to um, 
you can use the individual functions too. So if you want to set, set, uh, set axis limits, you basically just specify a vector of two numbers, for instance, inside of C, to one of the limit functions, all right? So for instance, here, I'm cutting the range of data on the x-axis just from one to three. It used to go from zero to five, cut. Uh, as you can see, actually, there are five cut levels. And it would go from zero, actually, I think one, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry. I think it goes one to five. But anyways, we're cutting the x-axis from one to three here. And then we're going to use labs to specify labels of our axes and the, the title. So for instance, um, here, <clears throat> I'm relabeling the x-axis with big caret. I'm relabeling the y-axis with price. Now you can also relabel the legend items, right? So cut has been mapped to the aesthetic called color. And when you want to specify the new name of a legend, you use the aesthetic name to specify, to tell it which one. So here I'm saying rename the color scale uppercase cut like this, all right? And then finally, the title is care versus price versus side cut right here. All right, so this is the title. Okay, so labs makes it really easy if you want to just make some quick uh, retitling adjustments. Okay, um, so guides, what you probably know as legends, visualize a scale by making a display of the scale and the variable values that are mapped to uh, values of that scale. For instance, the x-axis um, is a guide for the x aesthetic, right? This x-axis is a guide. Um, and then this, this legend is also a guide, all right? But the axis itself is a guide. Most guides are displayed by default. So usually if you map a variable to an aesthetic, ggplot will go ahead and put a guide in there for you. If you wanna turn it off, if you want to remove something, you can use the guides function to do that, right? So previously, without this guides, there would be a little um, legend on the right side here specifying which values of median are mapped to which values of color, all right? But since I said color equals none, it removes that guide and now it's gone, okay? Very, very easy. And if I wanted, if I didn't want the x-axis, I could say x equals none. If I didn't want the y-axis, I could say y equals none. And that would just remove all the labeling. It would still plot it. It just removes the labeling. Okay. Um, coordinate systems, we're not going to go into this at all. All the plots today we're going to be doing are on the Cartesian coordinate system. If you wanted to create plots and other coordinate systems, like the polar coordinate system, they are available in ggplot for you to use. Okay, um, faceting. Faceting is what many of you might know it as paneling. And basically, if you want to split a single plot into multiple plots by a variable, right? If you have a variable that you want to use to split, you know, some categorical variable like education level, let's say, and you want a separate plot for each education level, then faceting is what you do in ggplot to achieve that. There are two faceting functions, one called facet wrap and the other is called facet grid. And then the resulting graphs show how each plot varies along the faceting variable. So facet wrap will take a ribbon of plots into a multi-row panel of plots, okay? So here we have, remember, five levels of cut. Uh, you remember the cut variable? So here we have cut specified to color all in one graph. But if you wanted a separate graph by cut, you can use facet wrap. And facet wrap will just create a several rows of plots until it's done. Um, but it's basically just a ribbon like this. And so we get the same caret versus price, caret versus price plotted for each level of cut. Now notice inside facet, you specify the tilde, which is the formula, the way to specify formula in R. You specify tilde and then the name of the faceting variable. Okay, 
Um, you can add more than one fastening variable with pluses. So if you want to split by more two variables, you could do cut plus something else. And then if you want to have control over the number of rows and columns, there are arguments and row and end call. Um, so you can say exactly how many rows and columns you want. But fasted rep will basically just create a ribbon that keeps going until it's done. Fasted grid, on the other hand, allows you to specify which variables are splitting along the columns and which variables are splitting along the rows. You're going to use a tilde again, and you're going to put the column splitting variable before the, sorry, you're going to put the row splitting variable before the tilde, and then the column splitting variable after the tilde. And if you don't want to split along that dimension, you're going to put a dot. Okay, so here I have uh, fastening by two variables. Clarity is being used to split along the row. So clarity takes on these values, I1, S12, S1. I don't know what these things mean, but if you are into gemstones, you might know what they mean. But these are the clarity values along here. And then along the top, we have the column splitting variable, which is cut, right? So again, we've seen these variables, this, these values before. So these are the cut. And this kind of allows you to see, does the relationship between caret and price look the same across all of these different groupings? And you can quite easily tell the answer is no, right? This looks like a, you know, like a pretty, pretty gentle slope here but then this one goes sloping upward very quickly, right? So the relationship between pair and price is definitely not the same depending on what clarity and cut you have, okay? But again, the row splitting variable comes before the tilde and then after the tilde comes the column splitting variable. All right, so let's try some fastening. Create a panel of scatter plots of time versus size. This has we done many times, but now we want to facet by the variable treat Okay, and we're going to use facet grid. So we want to split by treat along the rows using facet grid. Okay. So ggplot, bitka, aes, x equals time, the same one we've been doing a million times, y equals size, okay, plus g on point, okay. Don't forget the parentheses. Now we're going to uh, split. Uh, grid using facet grid. And I said, I think I said, use it to split the rows using treat. So if we want a row splitting variable, it goes before the tilde. So I go treat tilde. Now, since we don't want to specify any variables to split along the columns, I'm just going to put a dot there. Okay. And when I run that, I should get two rows, right? One row for control and one row for ozone. And so this would allow me again to look whether the relationship between time and size appears to be the same between ozone and control. Okay, so fastening is another way to get another variable onto the graph, not just aesthetics, you can use fastening also to get more variables onto the graph. So you can put, you know, a ton of variables into the graph if you specify a bunch of aesthetics and you also facet. You could really have an innumerable number of, of, now of course that graph might be too complicated then to understand, but you could do it. Any question about fastening? Okay, very good. Um, I have a question actually. Yes, please. Can question. you change the, uh, like the, the, the color of the dots in each um, small graph? Like different color by graph? Yes. Like yeah, let's in fair is red and good is blue. Something like that. Let me see. If I I think if you did it here also, like this, maybe? Is that what you mean? Yep, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah just also specified in color then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So everything we talked about so far has to do with data. So you're either mapping some data variable to an aesthetic or using it to split graphs with faceting. Um, themes 
are what you use to control elements of the graphs that are not related to data. For example, if you want to change the background color or if you want to change the size of fonts. So this is where your fine tuning comes in, right? When you really want to make the graph look exactly how you want, you're going to use your themes. Also includes grid lines and color of labels. To modify these, we're going to use the theme function, which has a large number of arguments called theme elements, which control various non-data elements of the graph. It's a little hard to explain how theme works. It's easier to explain once we do some examples, but the explanation I'm going to give you now may seem a little abstract and weird, but I promise you it's not that hard once you start doing it. Okay, so some example of theme arguments and what aspects of the graph they control. So you can control, for instance, the lines forming the x-axis and the y-axis are controlled by axis.line, will control like the x-axis and the y-axis. If you just want to specify something just for the x-axis, you use axis.line.x. And so a lot of these themes are, they have, you know, one argument to control a bunch of themes, like axis.line will control both the axis and then more specific arguments to control, you know, just single elements like axis.line.x. Um, Legend.position, so if you want to move the legend around, the background color is controlled by panel.background, the border of the graph is controlled by panel.border, title controls the appearance of all the titles on the graph. There are a lot of these things. And let's see, I have a hard time. Uh, zoom bars in the way. But if you go to the theme page, sorry, this link at the bottom will take you to the help page for themes, you'll see there's quite a few. There's quite a few elements that you can look at or control using theme. And as I was trying to say before, some things control all elements. For instance, line can be used to control basically every line on the graph. But if you want to specifically control, for instance, um, like just the tick marks, then you'll do axis.ticks. If you want just the tick marks on the x-axis, you use axis.ticks.x. It'll take some experience and time for you to understand exactly how all these work, but we want to at least point you in the right direction. Okay. Well, let's get some practice with this. So how do you specify a theme? Most of the non-data elements of the graph can be categorized either as a line so you can think of the axes and the tick marks as lines, right? Or it can be categorized as a rectangle. So the background of the graph is a rectangle or it can be categorized as text. So all of your axes titles and all of your tick labels are text. Each of these categories has an associated element function to specify the parameters controlling its appearance. So if you want to specify the appearance of lines, you're going to use element line. Then you can use element rect for rectangles and element text for text elements. If you want to remove an element from a graph, you can just use element blank. So we're going to do all of this inside of theme. We, um, for example, here, the X and Y axes are lines, all right? And they're going to be both controlled by this argument axis.line. All right, so this controls both the x and y axes. Um, the element line function allows you to specify things like color, size, and line type, right? So if you want to have different colors of lines, or you want to have different thicknesses of lines, or different line patterns, you can specify these with element line. Okay, so you take the argument right, axis.line, you set it equal to the function, and then inside the function, you specify the arguments that control the appearance themselves, like color and size, okay? So this is all inside theme. I'm saying here, the axis lines, I want them to be black and two millimeters thickness. Now you can see what it did. Again, it controlled both the x and the y axis, this, although I said that backwards, but now it made them both black and two millimeters thick, okay? So that 
again, these axes are lines, so we're going to use element line. On the other hand, the background of the graph, think about what that is. That looks more like a rectangle, right? And for rectangles, we specify their fill color, their background color, which is just color, or for instance, their size. Okay, so I'm adding on to what I did before. So now I'm saying, um, I don't know, let's get rid of all these grid lines, right? And let's make the borders instead of dark black, gray. Okay, so here the fill equals white means that fill the color of the background, panel dot background is the background. Fill that with white and then make the border of it gray. So the border has become gray and it's filled with white. And again, that's element rect because the, ba the background is a rectangle. So everything is either a line, a rectangle, or it's gonna be text like I have here, okay? So with element text, we can control such properties like font family or font face. Font face means things like bold or italics or even bold italics. And this can control things like the title. Uh, and sorry, the title element controls the title of both axes, okay? And other titles and of this color scale too. So here I'm changing the family to a serif family. Okay, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, but it's changing the font family and then changing it to a bold face. So this is what it used to look like. I think this is something like Arial or Helvetica. And now I've changed the font to serif font and bolded it, okay? Now again, that's element text using the family and face functions. Um, by default, the only three fonts available are these three, the sans serif and mono fonts. Um, if you need more, I would go to this web page. It's not the easiest thing to do to get more, more fonts in there. It's not that hard, but it's not the simplest thing either. Okay. Um, there are a few theme arguments that do not use any of these element functions to control their properties. Um, one of the examples of that is like legend opposition. So legend opposition really can't be defined by a line or a rectangle or an element or a text, sorry. You're just saying, where do I wanna put the legend? Now notice the legend here is on the right. Now I'm gonna say, move the legend to the bottom. And if I scroll down, you can see, now I need to fix the labels, but it has been moved to the bottom, okay? Okay. Um, there's another element, another, sorry, another argument and theme called legend.text, which you can then use to rotate these numbers if you wanted to. Okay. And again, you're going to be using this ggplot theme documentation page a lot if you're going to be using theme because there are just so many things to remember. Okay. All right. Let's get a little bit of practice using this. So we're going to create a, the same scatter plot time versus size. Then I'm going to use the theme argument axis.ticks to erase the tick marks by coloring them white with element line. So we're going to do the same plot we've done a million times. As x equals time, y equals size, plus um, point. Okay. This is where we're starting. And now I say, I want to erase these little tick marks here, right? The little tick marks besides the numbers on the axes. Okay. So we're starting with the theme function. And then inside theme, I'm going to say axis.ticks. Okay. Now, is that a line? Is that a rectangle? Or is that text? Well, the little tick mark is a line, right? These little tiny lines, these little dash marks. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use element line, okay? And you can see um, our studio is trying to help me. It'll tell you what the available arguments are. And of course, if you ever forget, you can also look at the help file. Okay, and here I see that element line, I can do this color, size, line, time, line, in, and so on, okay? So I'm going to use the color argument color them white, which will make them essentially disappear. 
right? So now you can see there's no more little tick marks. I also, another way I could have done this, you know, I'm just gonna copy this. Another way I could have done this is by changing this to element blank. I believe this will work. Element blank just removes the elements. Yeah, another way of doing it. Okay. And again, you know, if I really, if I really wanted to, I could make the axis tick whatever color I want, right? Now I have red tick marks. Okay. So because these do not really have to do with data, we use theme. Now there's also in, uh, let me, let me ask, pause. Are there any questions? Any other questions about theme? There's a lot to go, there's a lot to do with theme. So um, I can, you know, it's okay. understand that it's confusing. Yes. Uh, I think I'm gonna cut my question. I just, I just saw a function, the theme function. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to say that you're, you're adding the different features of the graph that aren't data mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to say what the last thing you did was, where you said, uh, not that, it makes sense too. Uh, when you said axis ticks to the e equal to element line, mm -hmm. how, what is that doing? Are you sure. changing the tick? Line? Do you see the tick marks I'm talking about? Now they're red. They're, they're uh, small. Okay, yes, but these I little red things right here, yes. those are what I'm changing with this. So. Without, you know, without any specification, they're just white. I mean, they're black ones or, or they're grayish. So without further changing, they look like this. What I did initially was change them white, which will make them just disappear because the background is white. Now they're gone. Right. Yeah. But uh, what I'm saying is that you don't have to, there's, you're not mapping this to any kind of data. There's no, there's no data variable specified in here at all. Right, there's no, this is a data variable, this is a data variable. You could specify this without any data at all, and it will just erase the tick marks. That's all I mean. And for things like that, where you're trying to adjust something on the graph, like the appearance of lines, then that is just um, done through theme. Theme is for everything that doesn't have to do with data, basically. So if those tick marks, uh, you could change them from a line to a different shape by using element, maybe a uh, point no. or something like that. I, I don't no. think you can change their shape. Um, they're always going to be tick marks. You could probably change their size, um, but I don't think you can change them to some other. I'm not sure what shape you're thinking of, but like you could definitely change their size. Now they're huge <laughs> and they don't make sense, but you can do that. But yeah, I don't think you can change their safe, shape. Whatever. These are the only things, these are the things you could change about them right here. So whatever these mean, you can adjust, but that's all that's available. So could you set the text to element rect? Element like rect is, is, we had an example where element rect was used to adjust the background because the background, right, this gray background is a rectangle. Right. And so there we're using element rex to panel dot background specifies I want to adjust the background. And then here I'm saying it's it's a rectangle. And now I want to make it filled with the color white and I want the background to be gray. And what's the difference between the fill and the color? What's the difference between I'm sorry, fill and what? Fill and the color. The fill is the inside color. The gray is, so it's inside colored white, gray is the border color. So previously okay. the border is actually white. There's no border at all. But now I created a gray border. Great, uh, great. So uh, what I was wondering, so could you change the axis tick to a different thing besides line? Could you say element user? No. Oh, you can't, okay. No, it always, it's only, Every one of these um, arguments for theme only can have one element function. It never, you can only always use element line with axis.line, nothing else. Understood. Okay, thank you. That sounds good. I understood, thanks. Okay, thank you.
Okay, so that's how you, if you want to change one element at a time, you can use the theme function. On the other hand, sometimes you want to maybe change a bunch of elements all at once. Um, GCplot comes with a bunch of pre-made complete themes, which will change the overall background look of your graphics. Um, some examples are theme black white, theme light, theme dark, theme classic. Theme classic is supposed to uh, look more like base art graphics. So if you use base art graphics, not ggplot, just regular plot, regular uh, bar, uh, the axes look a lot like this, right? You have just the X and Y axis drawn as simple lines, all right? So this is theme classic, okay? Theme dark will make a really dramatic change, right? Theme dark will make uh, the background very dark, for instance, okay? And again, you just specify this pre-made theme and it'll change it all for you, okay? So those are pre-made themes. Saving a plot to file uh, is very easy with ggplot. There's a function called ggsave, and basically it'll save the last plot displayed by default. But you can also save a plot to an R object and then use that R object to save a specific plot. Let me show you what I mean. So um, ggsave will attempt to guess the device to use to save the image from the file extension. So use a meaningful extension. In other words, if you're trying to save a PDF, just name it .pdf. If you're trying to save a PNG, name it .png. And it'll, it'll then usually make a good guess that, oh, he, this person wants a PNG file. This person wants a PDF file. Um, some other arguments you can use with ggsave are width and height. Uh, these can be specified in different units. I think like inches or centimeters or pixels maybe even. Um, then you can specify the units of that these are measured in. DPI is to get different resolutions. Now, when you change DP, you're gonna have to play a lot with width, height, and DPI to get exactly what you want because changing DPI may change the size of the graph, change the size of the graph may change the DPI and so on. So it takes some fiddling. Uh, and then plot is the argument. If you've saved your plot into an R object, then you can specify which plot you want to save using the plot argument. So for instance, if I just said ggsave plot.pdf, it would save um, the last plot displayed as a PDF called plot.pdf. On the other hand, you can save your ggplots to objects in R. And then, for instance, I can slay, save this to P and it won't actually display it first. It's not until I then issue P by itself will it get displayed. All right, so you, but the, the figure that I created, the graph, is stored in this object called P. And then when I use ggsave, I can tell it which plot I want to save, saying plot equals P. If I didn't do that, it would just save this plot because it's the last plot that's been saved. Okay, or last plot that's been displayed, excuse me. So what I want you to try is I want you to save your last plot as mygraph.png and then try to view the file on your computer, all right? So here, I'm just going to do gg save and I'm going to call it myplot.png. And then I'm not sure where I am, actually. It's apparently saved it to c colon users that documents. Uh, and if I look there, there would be a file called myplot.png. I'm not going to go find it now, but it's there. And you can open it and look at it. So that's how you save. It makes it really easy to save uh, in ggplot. Any questions on anything we've gone over so far? OK. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. Um, let's take a five minute break. Come back at, let's say, 2.36 or so. And we'll continue with some exercises and then some, some of my advice for using ggplot that I've come across in my experience. Okay, so we'll come back. Um, during this, I'm gonna take a short break myself. If you have questions, now's a good time to ask them also. I'll be back in around one minute though, okay? Thank you. So everybody come back by 2.36 if you can, or in five minutes, please. All right, let's get back to the seminar. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to 
to build a graph from scratch together. All right, we're going to change data sets. So now we're going to be using a data set that's called Rabbit with a capital R, and it's also from the mass package. So if you've been able to use Sitka, you'll be able to use Rabbit also. Um, we're going to start with trying to formulate in our heads what we want to display. And then step by step, we're going to add to and then adjust the graph until we feel it's ready to share with an audience because it's in the form that we want it to be. OK, um, let's go ahead and get the, the data rabbit into R. So um, type data and then rabbit again, capital R, and then structure or SCR on rabbit, like this, or just use the code in the um, code file. <clears throat> All right, so the rabbit data set described an experiment where five um, rabbits- Please share your screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sharing. Sorry. At any time that's happening, don't feel shy about telling me I'm not sharing. Thank you. Um, Okay, so again, let me go back. If you haven't already, go ahead and run data rabbit and SDR on rabbit like this to get the rabbit data set into R. Okay, so the rabbit data set contains the variables. Um, I'm sorry, it contains an experiment or describes an experiment where five rabbits were each treated with both a saline control or a serotonin receptor antagonist blocker called MDL7222. Now, the details are not important. After injection of each treatment or control drug, each rabbit was injected with six ascending doses of another drug called uh, phenobiguanide, which raises blood pressure as a function of its dose. Then the change in blood pressure was measured as the outcome. Okay, so each rabbit's blood pressure was measured 12 times, six times under treatment, six times under control, and those six times are one for each dose of this um, blood pressure drug, okay? All right, so the purpose of, was to test whether blood pressure changes were dependent on activation of the serotonin receptors, right? So this, this phenol biguanide drug apparently uh, raises blood pressure as its dose is raised, and then they wanna know would that happen when you apply this other drug MDL7222, okay? So the data set contains 60 rows. It's five rabbits measured 12 times, six times under each treatment and control number. BP, BP change is gonna be the outcome. Dose is the dose of the blood pressure drug, the blood pressure inducing drug, all right? Run is just the label of the trial. Treatment is whether it's control or this MDL drug. And then the animal ID is animal, okay? And it goes R1 through R5, okay? So what we want to graph is a dose response curve. We want to see how blood pressure changes are related to the dose of phenobiguanide, which is the blood pressure raising drug, in the presence of both saline and this serotonin blocker or antagonist MDL7222, okay? Um, so the issues you want to think about, each rabbit was measured six times under both control and treatment drugs. How can we distinguish a separate dose response curve between these two conditions? So we want one dose response curve under control for each rabbit and one dose response curve for treatment for each rabbit. Okay, then um, also there are only five man animals that have been studied, right? It's a small sample size. Each um, is injected with six doses after being given control and treatment drugs. So we can fit all the individual rabbits' curves on the one graph, right? We only have 10 curves that we want to draw. Five rabbits, one for control, one for treatment for each rabbit, okay? So we want a graph that represents individual dose response curves for each rabbit, ideally separate curves for treatment and control per rabbit. Okay, so we're going to build this graph step by step. Give me one second. Closing the door. All right. 
So what GM will be required to create the dose response curve? Let's think to ourselves. Well, for curves and things like that, we probably want GM line, right? And then what are its required aesthetics? Think to yourself. Uh, GM line definitely requires X and Y, right? So we're definitely gonna have to have at least X and Y. Okay, so we're gonna initiate a new graph plotting the relationship between dose and BP change using G online for the data set rabbit. Okay, for now, let's just start with that. Okay, so dose on X, BP change on Y, and then we'll start with a G online. Okay, so ggplot, remember the first thing is always the data set, so it's rabbit, AES, and then X equals dose, capital D, and then Y equals BP change, capital BP, okay? And then we're gonna add G online. Now, what you see out of this may not look great, but that's okay, all right? That's not obviously five rabbits all mapped onto one graph, right? Something went wrong. We're gonna have to do more to this to get it right, okay? So first of all, we want to specify separate line, separate, sorry, separate lines by rabbit. How can we specify that? Remember, think about G online. What do we have to do in order to get separate lines by some variable? Well, we're going to have to map animal. Remember, animal is the ID variable for rabbit. We're going to map it to one of the grouping aesthetics like group, color, or line type. Okay. Let's imagine that we have to do a colorless figure, right? We're submitting to a journal that only accepts black and white figures, okay? So we're not gonna use color. We're instead gonna use line type to separate by animal, okay? So modify the previous plot by mapping line type to animal, okay? So remember, line type is an aesthetic. We can put it here and say line type equals animal with a capital A. Okay, what do we get of that? Well, it seems to have plotted separately by animal. We see the five animals, but it still doesn't look right, right? It doesn't look like what we'd expect a dose response curve to look like. Something is wrong here. Anybody have any idea what wrong? Think to yourself, what is wrong here? Well, think about what, how I described the experiment in the first place. Remember, it's six measurements under one drug and six measurements under another drug. But all of these have the same rabbit ID. So it's actually fusing the dose response curve for a control and treatment into one. And that's why it still looks wrong, okay? So even though there's five lines, we actually want 10 lines, right? We want one, two for each animal. And now we'll only get one for each animal, okay? So yes, we're gonna to have to somehow add the treatment variable to the graph. <clears throat> so once in the presence of treatment drug MDL, right, each rabbit was tested under treatment and under control. And they're still being joined as one. How can we accomplish that? Something, somebody offered this as a solution earlier. Well, one way is to assign treatment to a grouping aesthetic like color, and that will work like this. That's fine. Right, that looks actually totally fine. If we had a, um, a, a, a graph that, I'm sorry, a journal that allowed colored graphs, we could you know, more or less stop here and say, here, this is what we want. But we're constraining ourselves to be colorless. So we're gonna go without color. So how can instead we do it? How can another way to separate curves is with faceting, right? So now we're gonna facet. So now we're gonna split the graph into multiple graphs using facet. So now the variable is called treatment with the capital T. We're gonna use facet wrap to split the, we're gonna use facet wrap, right? So facet wrap, you just use tilde and then the name of the splitting variable. So I'm gonna use facet wrap, tilde, and then treatment. Okay, like that. And what will that do? That will give me two graphs, one for control and one for the treatment variable MDL. That definitely looks like we're getting somewhere, right? Now we have 10 curves, five on each graph, two for each M. 
All right, making good progress. Okay, now what do we want to do? So it can be a little hard to distinguish between the lines just based on line type. For instance, it's a little hard for me to distinguish between the lines for R2 and R5, for instance. It's, they both look kind of like small dashes or dots. It's hard to tell. So let's add some points to the graph, but let's vary the shapes of the points by treatment also. Okay, how do we add points to the graph that vary by shape? We're, we're going to need two things, right? First, how do we add the points? What do we want to use? We want to use G on points to add the points, right? But then we want to allow the shapes in geon point to vary by um, treatment. I'm sorry, by animal, by animal, by animal, excuse me, by animal. So we're going to use geon point with shape map to animal because we want each animal to have its own different shape. Okay, so I'm going to add a geon point layer. Okay, and then I want to. Um, map animal to shape. Now notice I'm doing this inside of geon point. Why? Well, if I did it here, I, yeah, I'm not sure if it'll error. Honestly, I don't remember if it'll error or not. So let me see. If I do it here, I think line will not know what this means, or I can't remember if it'll just ignore it. Okay, it just will ignore it. So I guess it's it's actually f totally fine to put it there. You can put it in either place. If yeah, if the aesthetic, if the particular GM doesn't understand it, it will just ignore it. But here I'm putting it inside of GM point. Okay, now I have <clears throat> both line type and the data points varying by the particular rabbit ID animal right here. Okay. So it's, for me, it's a little easier to tell the difference. And notice though that ggplot does something interesting. It fuses the two legends together. <clears throat> Technically, there should be one legend for line type and another legend for shape, but it actually fused them into one legend, right? So now solid line with circles is R1, this dash with triangles is R2 and so forth. So ggplot will sometimes fuse legends together like that for you. And most of the time, I think it's a good thing. Okay, oh, we already did this. Uh, but if you didn't do it, make sure to go ahead and add the, add geon point AES shape equals animal. Okay, now imagine we want to select the shapes that are plotted rather than using these defaults. Let's say I don't want this, these last two, I don't like them or whatever. For whatever reason, I don't like the shapes it picked for me. What can we use to change the shapes? Remember, what do we use to change the actual aesthetic values that are being used? We need a scale function, okay? And uh, for this one, we're gonna use scale shape manual, which means that we're changing the shape scale manually by specifying the values ourselves. Now the shapes are specified with integer codes that range from zero to 25. Um, you can look at the help page for points or for PCH to see um, the code for shapes. So if I go to the help file for points and I scroll down, here, here is a list of the numbers that correspond to each shape. Okay, so it's zero to 25. <clears throat> All right, so in this graph, let's use scale shape manual to change the shapes to those corresponding to the codes 0, 3, 8, 16, and 17. 0, 3, 8, 16, and 17. So then I add scale shape manual. And then for all of these scales, it's usually you're going to start with values. Okay. And then, um, what was it again? Zero, three, eight, sixteen, seventeen. I actually just kind of copy and paste that. <laughs> Don't remember. Zero, three, eight, sixteen, and seventeen. All right. So, you know what? I'll just copy zero, three, eight. Okay. 
And that changed. Previously, we had a different set of five, like the first one was the circle dot, but now I've just used these five that I've chosen. Okay. And it corresponds to those codes that I showed you on the help page for points. Okay. Okay. Now we're done adding to the graphs. We're not going to use any more of the data. We're going to do some fine tuning. For first, let's change the title of the x axis and y axis. What function can change both of those that we've learned already? Well, that function is called labs. Okay, so for the previous graph, change the title of the x axis to dose in micrograms and the title of the y axis to change in blood pressure. Okay, so here I'm going to use labs, add another layer, right? Labs, and then x equals, I think I said dose. And, and again, it's not so important you get these exactly right as you just kind of understand the concept of what we're doing. I totally forgot the name of change in blood pressure. Okay, and again, do whatever you want. It doesn't have to be exactly what I said, but at least you can see things changing, right? Now I can see I've changed the x-axis title here and the y-axis title here. Okay. Let me take a quick break. Any, any questions so far along this graph? Okay. Next. Almost there. Now imagine we don't like the gray background with the white grid lines and instead want to use a white background with gray grid lines. All right. So right now it's gray with white grid lines and we want a white background with gray grid lines. What function will we use to adjust each of these elements? Now, again, these do not have to do with the data, right? So we're going to use theme. The theme argument that controls the graph background is panel.background. Which element function should be used to specify the parameters for panel.background? Well, think again. What does the background look like? It's a rectangle, right? Thank you. So we're going to use element rect, exactly. Okay, theme argument panel.grid controls the grid lines. Which element function should we use to specify parameters for grid lines? Well, they're obviously lines. They're called grid lines, so we should use element line, right? Okay, so we're going to use the theme uh, function with the arguments panel.background and panel.grid to change the background color to white and the grid line color to gray 90. And I'll explain what gray 90 is in just a second. Okay, so we have theme, right? Inside theme, we're gonna start with panel.background. And again, for those of you that are not used to it, when it comes up like this, you can always hit tab, it'll complete it for you. Panel.background, now we're gonna set that to element rect, right? And we want to make it white, right? The inside of it white, the inside color is specified with fill. So we're gonna say fill equals white. All right, if you just wanna see what that does first, go ahead and run it. And you can see, yes, it is indeed white. Okay. Now we also want to add gray grid lines, which is, um, and I, I'm gonna separate panel.background and panel.grid with the comma, right, like here. And then I'll say panel.grid equals, and as we discussed, these are lines, so we're gonna use element line to specify their look. And in particular, we wanted to specify their color, which we said should be gray 90. Okay, and gray 90, you can spec, gray is for grayscale, and I think it goes from gray zero to gray 100. Gray zero, I believe, is essentially black. Gray 100, I believe, is essentially white. So gray 90 is a very, very light gray. Okay, so now we should get white background and light gray grid lines. Okay, does that make sense so far? Hopefully, not too hard, right? Yeah. One final step. Now let's say we want to use theme to adjust the axis, legend, and panel titles to use bold fonts. 
Okay. The theme arguments we're going to use are title. So by the way, when I say axis, these are the act dose and change in blood pressure are the axis. Animal is the legend right here. And then the panel titles are control and MDL. So these two things, we want to make them all both. So these three, change of blood pressure, dose, X and Y axis, and then the, the legend are all controlled by title. And then these two, the little panel titles are controlled by strip doc text. Now, which element function do we want to use to specify parameters for these? Of course, these are all text elements, so we're going to use element text, right? Okay, we're going to use the face argument and element text to set the titles to bold. So it's title and strip.text. So we're going to use theme again, and then set the face of the title and the face of strip.text to bold. Okay, so title equals element text and then it's the argument is face and then it's bold okay i'll just start with that and you'll see that changes x oops that changes x and y and legend right but not the little panel titles right here for those, I'm going to need strip.text and then the same thing, equals element text, Facebook. And that will change all of them to bold, just like this. And this is the graph we want. So I would feel comfortable presenting this to an audience, you know, um, it's a reasonably good looking graph and pretty easy to tell who's who at, in terms of animals. So I think it's a pretty decent looking graph. Any questions on what we just went through to make this graph at any point? Hmm. All right, if you've come up with questions, Send them to chat. All right, so here's some of just some of my advice for working with um, ggplot. It's not directly necessarily related to grammar, but some things I picked up along the way. Uh, we're going to be looking at a new data set called birth weight. Um, it contains data regarding risk factors associated with low infant birth weight. There are 189 observations of 10 variables. All the variables are numeric. Uh, so the, there's a low, which is an indicator of low birth weight, there's age, mother's weight in pounds, race, smoking indicator, number of premature births, uh, history of hypertension, and so on. Okay. Um, we're going to load the birth weight data set as we've done all the others. First run uh, data on it and then STR. Okay. So data, B-I-R-T-H-W-T, birth weight. FTR birth weight. Okay, now of course, most of the time you're going to bring in your own data, so you won't be doing these two steps, but um, I wanted to use pre preloaded data sets, so we all have them. This, these are the, uh, this is what the data set looks like. Okay. Okay, um, so variables in a data set can generally be divided into numeric variables where the number is a meaningful representation of a quantity and factor variables, where number values are usually codes representing membership to a category rather than, quant rather than some kind of quantity. In R, we can encode variables as factor with the factor function. So the reason why this is important is that some aesthetics can be mapped to either numeric or categorical, or categorical variables, i.e. factors, and they'll be scaled differently depending on whether it's a numeric or a factor variable. So for instance, this includes the X and Y. Um, if you, for instance, map X and Y to a continuous variable, you'll get a continuous axis. If you map it to a discrete variable, you'll get a discrete axis. Um, color and fill, uh, if you map it to a continuous variable, you'll get a gradient scale 
previously, when we had different shades of the color blue, when we use color, that's because color was mapped to a continuous variable. Um, if you want different colors, I'm sorry, if you, if you map color to a categorical variable or a factor, it'll instead use an evenly spaced hue scale, right? It'll use distinctly different colors for each category. Some aesthetics can only be mapped to categorical variables. So, so shape and line type must use categorical variables. If you try to use continuous, I think it'll give you an error. And then some aesthetics should only be mapped to numeric variables. Um, size and alpha should only be used with numeric variables. If you try to use it with categorical, you'll get a warning, but I think it'll still work. Okay, so let me give an example. So um, using the variables in the Berkeley data set, I'm going to show you what happens when we map a, a numeric variable to, a, uh, to color first. So when, um, when the Berkeley data set is loaded, uh, the race variable here, you can see, is just a numeric code one, two, three. It's an integer, right? It's not a factor. It's not been declared categorical. So R interprets it as just a numeric variable. So when you say color equals race, it'll give you this um, gradient scale instead of distinct colors by race. This is probably not what we want. You know, there's no race 0.5, there's no race 2.5. This doesn't look right. Okay, so this is probably not what you want. Um, now, it, this may make sense though for truly continuous variables, right? If this were a size variable, then it would make sense to use a gradient. Instead, though, if you want to use, um, if we wanted to use different colors for each different race, we can force it to do that by uh, converting race to a factor. And you can convert to a factor inside of the ggplot functions. So here, instead of just race, I'm putting race inside a factor. And then you see that ggplot now interprets race as a truly categorical variable and gives a separate color, that's a separately distinct color for each race. And no 1.5, no 2.5 here. Okay, so how your variable is defined in R will possibly affect how um, the aesthetic behaves. Okay. In error results, if we try to map shape to a numeric version of race, because shape only accepts factor variables. So had I not put race inside a factor here, this would have erred. Because if you think about it, there's only so many shapes. There are those shapes 0 through 25. There's 26 shapes. It doesn't really make sense to map some a shape to 2.73. You know what I mean? So it needs to have categories, all right? And then finally, some aesthetics like alpha and size should really only be used with truly numeric variables. And a warning will be issued if the variable is a factor. So here, I, I gave it factor race. It works in the sense that it produces a graph, but then it gives you this warning. Okay. So it really wants you to use continuous variables with size and alpha, not factor variables. Okay, so for this reason, we recommend that you convert categorical variables to factors before graphing. All right, this then you don't have to enclose the variable and factor each time you create the graph. And more importantly, it will use the labels that you specify in factor to label the graph. All right, so for instance, um, all of these variables right now, low, race, HT, and smoke, currently are just numeric, numeric variables, right? Low, HT, race, I forget the last one. All right, all of them are numeric codes, but with the factor function, you can then apply labels, right? So here I'm saying when low is zero, that means, oops, that should say not low, but now it says now low, and a one means low. And then like one <laughs> means white on race, two means black, three means other, all right? So now we can apply labels and what's nice is then ggplot will use these labels. So right now, I want you to go ahead and just copy, and copy these four lines of code into RStudio and run them. Okay. So I'll just run them.
Okay. So then we're going to issue, uh, you can look at the structure again, you don't have to do this, but just to make sure, I'm going to look at structure. And now I see that several of my variables are factors, right? Low is a factor, race is a factor, smoke is a factor, hypertension is a factor also. Okay. Now create a scatter plot of age and birth weight for the data set birth weight. Try mapping an appropriate variable besides race to shape and then another to alpha. Okay, so I'm gonna create a scatter plot of age and BWT first. So let's just start with that. So, oops. Easy plot, birth weight, AS, X, I forgot my variable, sorry. X equals age, Y equals BWT. X equals age. Y equals BWT. And then we're just going to do a scatter plot. So that'll be G on point. Okay. Birth weight, the data set. Age is on X. BWT is on Y. Scatter plot. Okay. Then I say try mapping an appropriate variable to shape and then another variable to alpha. So what kind of variables shape what? Shape wants a factor. So I can map any of these low race, I said not to use race, HT or smoke to shape. Let's do shape equals low. Okay, first we'll start with that. You can look at that now if you want. Okay, we have two shapes now, circle and triangle. And then I said, uh, try finding one for alpha. Now alpha on the other hand wants a truly numeric variable. So what other variables can I use that are numeric? Well, um, how about LWT or FTV or any one of those? I'm just going to use LD, LWT. Okay. And now my points are, tr uh, the transparency of the points is a function of LWT. Okay. And that works because LWT is a numeric variable. Again, had I tried doing LWT in shape, I think it will give me an error. Yeah, continuous variable cannot be mapped to shape. So make sure you use categorical variables, especially factors with shape, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, sometimes you're gonna have to deal with overlapping data points in a scatter plot, okay. So sometimes two points will appear on the same place in a scatter plot. And yes, uh, jittering is one way of handling that. So here's an example. So in the birth weight data set, there are um, three races and age is measured in uh, years. So there's gonna be a lot of overlap. You can't tell how many people are actually white and 20 years old or black and 20 years old. There's, you have no idea how many points are stacked on top of each other here. Uh, so that can be a problem. Um, there are 189 actual observations, but obviously not 189 data points plotted here. Okay. So we have um, a choice of what we call position adjustments, position adjustments, which can be specified to the position argument in a geom function. Okay, this does not go inside of AES, by the way. It's not an aesthetic. So you're not mapping it to a variable. So it goes outside of AES. For G on point, we're gonna use either position equals jitter, which adds a little random noise to the position, or we're gonna use position equals identity, which will overlay the points on top of each other. So the default is just to use position equals identity. This is what you get if you use position equals identity. But if you use position equals jitter, it adds a little bit of noise to both the X and the Y value, right? So it'll add a little noise to X, meaning it'll go a little to the left or a little to the right. And then it'll add a little noise to Y, meaning it'll go a little up or a little down. So now you have a better idea of, for instance, most of the blacks tend to be on the lower uh, age and we have fewer observations on the upper age and more data on the lower ages, for instance. We can tell from this graph, it looked like there's just as many people at the higher ages as there are the lower ages, but clearly there are more people at the lower ages. Okay. 
That is for um, scatter plots. But sometimes you have overlapping bars and bar graphs, and you also need a position argument there. Okay, so remember that G on bar is going to plot the frequencies of the variable mapped to X as bars. Then we can also map a second variable to fill, and then the bars will be colored by the second variable. Okay, um, we can use the position argument in G on bar to control the placement of the bars with the same X value. So remember, previously, um, we had this situation where we have a stack bar chart. So we have you know, this many people who are of other race, this blue bar represents other race and uh, low birth rate, okay? And, um, but it, all three of these little segments have the same X value low, right? This is, uh, this graph results because the default in Gion bar is to use what's called position equals stack, which says that if um, observations have the same X value, stack them on top of each other in the bar plot. Another option we can use instead is called position equals dodge. And this is what you probably know as a side-by-side -side bar graph, right? Okay, so I'll go down. So now inside Gion bar, sorry, let me, let me go back up. If, if I don't do anything, it'll by default use position equals stack. But instead inside I can say, then say outside of AES, position equals dodge, right? And now it'll put the bars side by side instead, okay? So this style stacking is a good compromise. You can see both proportions somewhat and counts somewhat, right? So for instance, here you can say like in the non-low birth weight group, whites take up a very large proportion. But you can also get a reasonable idea of counts, although it's easiest to count the, the, the low bar. A little harder to count the higher bars because you have to do some subtraction. But you get both. With position equals dodge, you really get counts, right? It's very easy to count how many are in each group with this graph. It's a little harder to compare proportions though. If you really want to compare proportions, you can use the final option, which is position equals fill. And this will normalize the size of the bars so that it just goes from zero to one. And now it represents the percentage or the proportion that each of the groups take, each of the races take here. So this is not a count really anymore. It's really more like a proportion. Okay, but that's position equals fill. Okay, how are we doing? All right, we're gonna use the Gion bar with data set birth weight, uh, sorry, use Gion bar with the birth weight variables low and smoke together with position adjustments to answer two questions. Are there more low birth weight or non-low birth weight babies with mothers who smoked in the data set? Okay, let's start with that one. Are there more low birth weight or non-low birth weight babies with mothers who smoked in the data set. Okay, so let's look. Um, we're gonna do ggplot, birth, weight, AES. Let me look at my variables again. I want low and smoke. So um, low, I'm gonna put on the x-axis and then smoke I'm gonna use as fill, okay? So I'm gonna say AX, X equals low, and then fill equals smoke. And then I'm gonna start with Gion bar. Okay, so the first question I ask is, are there more low, low birth weight or non-low birth weight babies with mothers who smoked? Um, so mothers who smoked are blue, and I'm asking are there mo more low birth weight babies. I'm sorry, what did I ask again? Oh, okay, sorry. Are there more low birth weight babies or non low <laughs> birth weight babies for mothers who smoke? So is this one higher or this one higher, basically? In this case, you can answer it either way. Um, but yes, it appears there are more non low birth weight. I apologize, I should just change this to non, non low. Oops, did I screw it up? 
von A. Ah, let me start over. There we go. Okay. Um, from here, we can tell there's more not low birth weight babies. And then the second one, are babies from mothers who smoke proportionally more likely to be low birth weight or non-low birth weight? Um, are babies from mothers who smoke, <laughs> now I realize these exercises are kind of difficult to understand. Are babies from mothers who smoke proportionally more likely to be low birth weight or non-low birth weight? So mothers who smoked proportionally more likely to be low birth weight or non-low birth weight. In this case, I probably should switch the two. Yeah, so they're more likely in this case to be for mothers who smoke, not low birth weight still. I think in the first one, what I wanted to actually show you was this. I should rethink these two exercises though, now that I look at them. But basically, if you use position equals dodge, it's easier to compare counts. And if you use position equals stack or position equals fill, it's easier to compare our proportions. Here, I could easily compare who has the higher accounts. It's very easy to tell who has the highest accounts here. And then with position equals stack or fill, it's easy to tell who has proportionally more. I apologize, that is not the best exercise and I'll have to work on that one again. Okay, I'm not gonna go over error bars and confidence bands today. It's a little complicated. Um, if you need to go over it, I would, uh, if you need to learn it, you can look at this yourself, but I'm not gonna take the time to go over it today. I am going to go over annotating though. So sometimes you need to add a note or annotations directly to the graph. And this has nothing to do with any variable in the graph data set. For instance, you may want to label a particular data point on your graph, or you may want to have like a box that outlines a certain portion of the graph that highlights it. To do this, we can use the annotate function. To use annotate, the first argument is the name of a geom, for instance, uh, geom text or geom rect. Uh, then subsequent arguments are the aesthetics associated with that geom, like X and Y, and then anything else you need. I know that's kind of vague. You just, just uh, hold on and see, and I think it'll make sense as we go through examples. Okay, so let's imagine we have this data set, and you can see we have this outlier way up here right up here. And let's say we want to label this with something. Okay. We're going to add annotation text. So we're going to use the geom. We haven't used geom text before, but we're going to use it now and annotate. And geom text, you basically say with X and Y, where should it go on the graph? So in other words, if X value is around 45, its Y value is around 5,000, right? So it should be around 40, I'm sorry, 42, and 5,000, okay? You know, the positioning is gonna take some experimentation. Um, I mean, the data point's at 45, but I want it to be left of the data point, so I'm putting it actually at 42, right? For, if I put it at 45, it would be centered on top of the data point. Okay, but here I say the name of the geom is geom text, so I just put text. If I wanted an annotate with a point, I would put point in there. And then I say it located at X equals 42, Y equals 5,000, and it has this labeled data error. Okay, and then it puts that right there. Here's another example. Let's say we wanna highlight a portion of the graph that features birth weights within one standard deviation of the mean weight. We'll create a rectangle using geom rect that spans the X axis for its full width from 13 all the way to 46. So this graph goes from about 13 to 46. And then we want to go from 2215 to 3673, which is one standard below and one standard deviation above the mean. All right. And then I'm going to set alpha equals 0.2 to make the box transparent. So geom rectangle is what we're using here. And in geom rectangle, you specify four coordinates, the min and max x values and the min and max y values, all right? And then I'd say alpha equals two, which is pretty transparent. And then it creates this transparent gray 
rectangle on top. Okay. So annotation or annotate, excuse me, allows you to add little annotations to the graph that don't really have anything to do with any variable in your data set. Any questions on annotate? Okay. Now, one of the final sections we're going to go over is working with colors in R, uh, in, I'm sorry, ggplot. Um, there were some questions about this earlier. We can specify a color in R in different ways. One way is with a string name. And some of these things may be unfamiliar to you. And if, if that's true, it's not a problem. Um, just bear with me. We'll get through this. You can also specify using hex codes. And again, you may not know what that is, and that's OK. Or RGB numbers um, with the function RGB. Um, we've already used string names like white and green before. You can issue colors, the colors function in R, to see a full list of available colors names. So if I just type out colors in R Studio, it will give me 657 color names that it understands. All right, so you can use those. We can also use hex color codes. These hex codes usually consist of a pound sign or hashtag followed by six numbers or letters, all right? Um, where the first two digits represent red, the second two green, and the last two blue. And you'll notice RGB is also red, green, blue. So red, green, blue is one very common system of specifying colors. You specify how much red there is, how much green there is, and how much blue there is. For example, the hex code uh, 00, well, hashtag 009900 would represent a green shade, while hex code FF00EE represents a purple shade. Uh, apparently, I give you a, a tool like this can help you uh, yeah, figure out. So this tool, for instance, can help you figure out what the hex code is associated with a particular color. You know, you can just find whatever color you want and then, oh, I like this color right here, and then copy this and use it directly with the hashtag. Okay. Um, so here I specify I want the color of all points in Geon Point. Notice it's not inside AES. All of them to be this color, which is this kind of orange brown color. All right. So hex codes specified in quotes with the hashtag. Finally, you can also use RGB function, uh, which again specifies red, green, blue. Um, specify three numbers between zero and one. Zero means none of this color. One means a lot of this color, right? Uh, so for instance, 0 0.7501 means quite a bit of red, no green, and a lot of blue, which should give us something kind of purple color, right? And actually, once you run the RGB function, R will output the hex code for you. All right, but we can directly use RGB in a, a color specification also, right? So here I'm saying setting the color of the points to this purple that I created here. Okay. So R is very flexible in how you can specify colors. Um, there are different color scales too. Oh, actually I went over this, right? We already went over where for a continuous variable, it's going to be a gradient color scale. And for a factor variable, we're going to get this discrete color scale, right? We've already gone over that. There are some color scale functions that can help you create color scales, too. One, for instance, is called Scale Color Brewer. If you've ever been to the Color, uh, the color Brewer website, um, this person uh, uh, a little while ago created a bunch of different sets of palettes of colors that look good together, but also emphasize differences. So if you want to like a sequential color scale that represents, you know, a scale that should go from low to high, or you can have qualitative scales for, you know, true categorical variables. And we'll go over more about color brew in a minute. Uh, you can use scale color gradient, which creates a high low color gradient scale, this is what's used for numeric variables. So if you want, you know, light blue to dark blue or light green to dark green, you would use scale color gradient. Scale color hue is used to create evenly spaced hues around the color wheel. And this is generally what's used for factors. 
And then we've already used this before ourselves. You can use scale color manual if you want to just manually specify which colors you want. So for example, with scale color gradient, we can define the colors that define the ends of the gradient with the arguments low and high. So we can say, go from this color at the low end to this color on the high end, all right? The default gradient runs from a bluish black at the low end to a light blue at the high end. We can redefine the scale to go from a very light green, which I'm calling honeydew, to a dark green, which is called dark green. And so these are just two names that I picked out one of them was a light green and one of them was a dark green. And then those are the low and high end points and I can specify that as my continuous color scale. Okay, so that's scale color gradient. Um, I can also, oh yes, it might be easier to use RGB where uh, I can say, I can start with a kind of a lightest green with 0.2 here, going to a really intense green with a full one there. So remember G is green, so it goes red, green, blue. So I'm, I'm just adding a, a lot more green. And now you can see it ranges from this kind of darkest black, blackish color to a very bright green. All right, so there are many different ways you can specify this gradient. On the other hand, you can also use um, scale color hue, where we define a color scale by specifying a range of colors to use, and then our ggplot will choose evenly spaced hues uh, in that range. Okay, so the relevant arguments to scale color hue are h, which is the range of hues to use on a color wheel, and this should be a vector of two numbers between 0 and 360. So if you, in other words, if you specify 0 and 360, it'll go around the entire color wheel. But if you only want to go through half of the color wheel, uh, you can go from like 0 to 180, for instance. H start, H dot start is the first hue. And then the direction is which way to travel around the color wheel. You're going to have to look at a color wheel to understand all of this. But just to, just to show you, here, for instance, I'm saying just stick to the first quarter of the color wheel, right? For instance, it's just ranging from this kind of greenish to this reddish. We're not getting any of the blues or any of the yellows or any of those other colors in here right now. We're just getting a small portion of the color wheel right now. So H is the, the range. And then H dot start says, where do I want to start? So here I don't use the range. I don't specify the range. So it's using the full range here, but I'm having it start in a different place. So the typical three is kind of a red, kind of a blue and kind of a green actually. Now it's more of like an orange, green, and purple because I started it in a different place. And again, we've also used scale color manual um, where you can specify the colors yourselves in any way you want. And here I use three different specifications, one using RGB, one using a hex code, and one using the string. Okay, so R and ggplot are very flexible in how you specify your colors. Um, and it has a lot of tools to help you come up with different hues. Now, if you like, you know, making really beautiful graphs that has uh, that have colors that work together well, one source you can use for palettes is the Color Brew web page. And for instance, here, this you know I mentioned there's sequential, diverging, and qualitative. So if you need a sequential color scheme. You could use this one. Let's say you like this one. Well, you can then just take these three hex codes and just plop them into R, for instance. And you know, you, you can say, oh, I need nine classes, actually. There are nine different values. Oh, uh, and this is sequential. Oh, I don't want, let's say I want something more orange. And this is for, uh, again, a sequential scale. But let's say you wanted a nominal scale where everything should be treated as a different category. Well, you can pick one of these and, again, pick the number of different um, values on the scale. And then you can either copy these yourself or you can use one of these pre-made functions to um, collect one of those. So there are sequential, diverging, and qualitative. <clears throat> and each of these can be specified as a type. And then if you go back, oops, uh, sorry. If you go back to the color brewer page, I apologize. Um, each of these has a name associated with the two. It's right here. So this one is called pastel one, for instance. And 
um, the palette, you can give it the name of the palette right there. The other palettes have different names too. So, you know, if I change to this one, it had this one is called BRBG, for instance. So you can give it the exact palette name you want, and it will use the palette um, called that. And the direction again is going in the one order or going in the reverse order if you don't want to use all the colors, for instance. So, for instance, here I'm using a sequential palette. And I'm using this palette that's called RDPU. So one of these palettes in sequential, maybe this one, yeah, it's probably some version of, yeah, it's this one, RDPU. Um, that's the palette I chose. And then it uses three colors. So there are three races, so it chooses three colors. And actually, basically, it's doing this. Go down to three, and it's using these three colors right here, OK? And so, yeah, if you like that page, you like the colors on that page, you can use that page to pick a palette and then use one of these functions to select that palette. Or you could just use these hex codes and create the palette yourself manually through scale code and manual. All right. OK, I'm not going to actually do these um, exercises. So that is the last section of material. Um, are there any questions on anything that we've gone over so far? We'll have more time for questions at the end. The last few things I want to talk about are there's a book about ggplot2. If you're really going to use it a lot, it's a very concise, easy to read book. In fact, this whole presentation is basically based on the first chapter, or sorry, chapter three of this book. So most of the information in this seminar can be found directly in this book, too. Um, Okay, we have three more exercises to do, and then I'm going to let you go. Um, of course, you know, if you, if you need to leave, you can leave at any time, but I encourage you to stay and participate because then you'll really, um, hopefully then all the concepts that you learned will sink in. Okay, so for the final set of exercises, we're going to be used a data set stored on our website, which we will load using the following code. All right, so all I want you to just copy and paste this directly into R. It's also in the help file if you need it. I mean, in the code file, I'm sure it's hopefully. Yeah, it's also here around line 242 in the code file, but I'm just going to copy and paste it myself. Okay. All right. Okay, then run that. Okay, uh, this data set contains demographic and academic data for 200 high school students. We will be using the following variables, um, read, write, math, and science, which are academic test score variables, female, which is gender, which has two levels in this data set, female and male, honors, which is enrollment in an honors program, which also has two levels, enrolled and not enrolled. SES is a three level factor for socioeconomic status, low, medium, high, low, middle, high, excuse me. And school type is a two level factor with private and public. Okay, so please go ahead and copy and paste this code and get this data set loaded into R. Okay. Exercise one create a graph of box plots of the variable math across levels of the variable honors. Color the inside of the boxes by female. Change the inside colors to blue and gold. All right, I'm going to give you two minutes to try this on your own. Okay, you're going to do box plots of the variable math across levels of the variables honors, then color the inside of the box by female, then change the inside colors to blue and gold. And again, I'll give you two minutes to try this. On your own, and we'll go over it at the end. The name of the data set, by the way, is HSB, I believe. Yeah, HSB.
And again, if you don't get it, no problem. We're going to go over it together. Twenty more seconds. Now changing to the blue and gold is going to be the hard part, probably for most of you. Let's try this. And again, don't worry if you didn't finish. We'll hopefully you learned something from it. Okay. So I said, once again, box plots of the variable math across levels of the variable honors, color the inside by female, change to blue and gold. Okay, so ggplot, always start, first the name of the data set, HSB, then we have AES. Inside AES, we want to map honors to X, and then Y equals math. We know we're going to want a box plot, right? So I'm going to go ahead and add Gion box plot. If I didn't do that, it would just look like this. But I want to color the inside of the boxes by female. Now, whenever I say the inside, that should be a, a, a clue that I want fill, right? OK, so if I did fill equals female, it will give me colored like this, right? But let's say now I want to change it to blue and gold. Well, we know to change the values of an aesthetic, we use a scale function, right? So it's going to be scale. Now, which aesthetic are we changing? It's not color this time. I know you probably want to say color, but it's fill. There's a scale fill. So we want to do scale fill manual instead. Okay, and always values, right? To specify which values we want. And then it's going to be inside the C function, we're going to specify blue and blue. Okay, any questions on that exercise? Pretty simple, right? Okay, we, all, we have three of these, so bear with me. Exercise two, create a bar graph that displays the counts of the number of students that fall into groups made up of the following four variables. <laughs> Female, prog, school type, SES. For example, from such a graph, we can know how many female students in the academic program who go to public school who are of high school economic, who have high socioeconomic status are in the data set. So I want all four variables represented on this graph in some way. All right, a bar graph. I'll give you another two minutes on this one too. Okay, one more minute.
Okay, 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Um, so whenever you have this many variables, you're probably gonna wanna do some sort of faceting, right? You're probably gonna need to split um, the, the graph into multiple graphs, all right? So yeah, okay. So this is plot, HSP, AS, and I said email, prog, School type. Okay. So I'm going to say x equals female, fill equals prog. Now you can specify these and wherever you want, just get all four on the graph somehow. And any configuration of the four will be fine. Um, we want a bar, right? And then the, the last part is we're going to use facet grid. And I want SES on one and then school type on the other. So this one will split along the rows, this one will split along the columns. And then uh, we'll have bar graphs uh, where the coloring is by prog, right? So we have males and females. We have three SCS values and then two school type values like this. And again, you could have mixed and matched these four in any place you want. You could have put school type here, prog here, whatever. One nice thing is that you can still specify your position in here and read if you don't want stack, you can do dodged bar graphs like this too. So uh, ggplot is very smart about paneling like that. Okay, final exercise. It's a bit longer. All I want you to do is recreate this graph. And you'll notice though that there's like no grid lines, no background, uh, overall background, these fonts are in red. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little longer. I'll give you four minutes on this one. This is read and this is write, by the way, read and write, and this is math. So read, write, and math are the variables you need. There's not much to say about time series, except that ggplot does not have any function specifically made for time series. So you usually need to get your data set into some form for G online, um, but it won't just automatically like work with a TS data set, I don't think. That's my understanding of time series and ggplot. I know the difficult. There's a lot going on, so there are a lot of elements to this graph, or to, to adjusting it. And notice that the fonts are all mono. Not only are they red, they're also mono fonts. All right, halfway through, another two more minutes, and then we'll go over it.
One more minute. Twenty more seconds. Okay, we're gonna go over it again. Don't worry if you didn't get it all. I'm not. Even, I'm not even gonna bother typing this one. I'm just gonna. I'm sure I'll forget something. Okay, this is just one solution. So we have x, read on x, write on y, and math has been mapped to color. Hopefully you all got that. That's the basic end. Geom's point will give you the data points. Geom smooth will give you the best fit curve with this confidence interval. To make the curve red, you use color equals red, okay? So for lines, there's just color. There's no fill, it's just color, all right? But it's for, 2D objects like squares and circles that you might need color and fill. Then I relabeled these. If you didn't relabel it, it would say read, write, math. So relabeling these to say reading score, writing score, math score. Then um, I need to make these mono and red. So these elements are all controlled by title, which we've done before. Title is a text element, so we're going to set it to element text. The family is what's controlling the mono look here. So it's, remember, it's mono, serif, or sun, for sun serif. Uh, this one is mono. And then I say color equals red to change it red. And then finally, I got rid of the background grid lines by saying panel.background equals element blank, which actually just removes the background altogether. So no background at all. OK, that's that graph. All right, are there any final questions? Because we are done otherwise. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to everyone for coming um, and sitting through this and participating along with me. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be sticking around for a little bit more uh, if you have final questions. Um, and yes, we'll try to post it with, let's say, in a few weeks to a few, it could be several weeks before it gets up there. It will take some time for the recording to make it up, but we hope to get it up sometime, okay? And again, we'll be sticking around for any final questions. So please, if you have any, you can ask us now. Okay. Uh, can you stop recording?